Hello, and welcome to our new Bible study series on the post-exilic period. My name is Edwin Weber. I'm one of the pastors at St. Mark's Lutheran Church in Spokane, Washington, whose ministry provides for these video Bible studies. Thank you all for participating and for your generous support of our ministry, which makes this Bible study possible. Today, we're going to be starting our examination of the post-exilic period uh, by looking first uh, today at the book of Ezra, but we're going to be looking at a lot of different books. Ezra and Nehemiah are two books that provide the primary narrative details from this period of biblical history, but we also have several prophets who are operating during this time who have their own books in the Bible. So in addition to the narrative of Ezra and Nehemiah, we also have prophetic works which, while they don't tell the story directly to the audience, uh, still reveals a lot about what was going on during this time. So in addition to Ezra and Nehemiah, we'll also look at several works of the prophets, including Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, and even take a look a little bit at the book of Isaiah. Now, part of the reason that I have um, structured this series in this way is because there are a lot of different perspectives on theology, spirituality, righteousness uh, from this period of time. Now, I could have just picked one of these books. It would have given you just one perspective, and perhaps there's nothing really wrong with that. But uh, as I like to say sometimes, our Bible is not a book. Our Bible is a library with many, many different books, many, many different perspectives. And sometimes they're wildly different. I really stru struggled with how I could structure this course in a way to look at things um, where there are different biblical perspectives out there. And I thought that the best way for us to do was to present um, the prophets, the writers, in concert with one another, in dialogue with one another. So we will be looking at a variety of different writings and perspectives from uh, political leaders, uh, priests, prophets, and all sorts. Um, really because this question about what is restoration, what does restoration mean for us, um, is, a, is a question that was answered differently by a variety of different people. Now it is in this context of um, post-exile, this period of restoration that these stories and prophecies, they come from. So when I say uh, post-exilic, uh, that's what I'm referring to. I'm referring to this time uh, that followed immediately after the end of the Babylonian exile. And you might remember part of the story, right, that God's people, they were conquered in the 6th century um, by Babylon. First, the political leaders, the priests, the artisans, they were all taken into exile, deported into the east to live there in uh, Babylon. Um, then later, there was a rebellion against their Babylonian overlords back in uh, Judah. Uh, and as a consequence of that, the city of Jerusalem was uh, destroyed along with the temple. And God's people were scattered across the face of the earth. For something like 70 years, God's people lived in exile. And that all changed, though, and rather dramatically with the rise of the new Persian Empire. Persia was led by Cyrus, sometimes known as Cyrus the Great, uh, and he conquered the whole region uh, for Persia, including Babylon. Now, interestingly enough, Persia had a policy of religious toleration that was actually quite unique throughout um, both the region and this period of history. Um, basically, the Persians allowed God's people to return to their homeland, to rebuild the temple, and to restore, uh, to resume worship of God there. And uh, believe it or not, they did that not just for the Jews, but they did that for everybody in their empire. Their empire had consisted of a number of conquered people um, under the Babylonians, the Assyrians, you know, you name it, it had happened. So um, this, this uh, self-determination, this uh, ability to uh, have religious freedom, this ability to return to your homeland was experienced by all people under the reign of Cyrus. Uh, and of course, what we get is the main biblical witness 
from the Jewish uh, people from this time frame. Now, for this reason, this period of biblical history is also known as the Persian period, right? Sometimes it's called the post-exilic period, sometimes it's called the Persian period. So you might uh, hear me refer to it either way, and I just don't, don't want you to be confused. They mean the same thing. They're referring to this time where it was the Persians who ruled over um, Israel um, this time immediately following the exile. Now, the Persian kings are really important. They're integral, uh, intricately uh, interwoven into the story. Um, so we will see references to Persian kings uh, in Ezra and Nehemiah as their stories are told. So I want to look briefly at Ezra and Nehemiah, where their stories come from, and then we'll dive in a little bit more de uh, into Ezra's specific uh, uh, book. But um, Ezra himself uh, is from a priestly family. Um, so that means that, that uh, and they lived in exile. Um, we think, uh, it sounds like Ezra was born during the period of exile. So he would not have known the temple um, before it was destroyed. But his uh, parents or grandparents did, who were probably there with him. Um, so they were deported probably in that first deportation. Uh, when Babylon first conquered Jerusalem, they were probably taken into exile during that time frame and had lived there ever since. We're also told that Ezra was a scribe and a teacher of the law. Um, so these terms are referring to um, pretty much his work as a biblical scholar, in a sense, you might say. Um, this was the time period in which the position of rabbis were being developed. You can't quite call them rabbis yet, um, but that ministry of study of the Torah, study of God's word, was emerging during this time. And so you can kind of imagine Ezra as being sort of like an early rabbi, sort of like somebody who would have been a priest if he had been um, born and raised in the temple. And now he's got this great opportunity to go back home, work on the restoration of the temple, rebuild it, and resume uh, worship of God there. So, with this understanding of who Ezra is, we shouldn't be all that surprised to learn that as we read his book, we're going to see um, a lot of uh, attention focused on rebuilding of the temple uh, and on in uh, the enforcement of the law of Moses. Um, again, think about who Ezra was, priest, teacher of the law. Um, these are the things that he's going to be concerned with. Now, by contrast, um, Nehemiah is a, not a priest, but a governor. He was appointed by the Persian king to be the governor of um, Judah, of, of, of the Jews. Um, so we have, what we have is a, a different focus. Nehemiah is uh, focused on the law of Moses, like Ezra is, but uh, he's focused more on Sabbath regulation. We'll talk more about that later on. Um, but uh, he's also focused on gubernatorial types of things. Ezra's focused on rebuilding the temple. Nehemiah is focused on rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. Um, so uh, we will see a lot of similarities and a lot of different, but some differences too, between Ezra and Nehemiah. We often think of Ezra and Nehemiah as a single unit. Um, they are often presented together, uh, even if they are two stories of two different people, a priest and a governor, and two different perspectives in, in that regard. But um, you know, when we read Nehemiah, you really get the impression that Nehemiah himself um, might have written it. And we do think that the original source material for uh, Nehemiah was written by Nehemiah as a memoir. And as we read Nehemiah, you will see there are actually sections where Nehemiah uses the first, first person uh, pronouns referring to um, actual things that he, he has done. Um, and you notice also it's a recollection He's also, you know, he's imploring God to, to look upon favor um, to his reign, uh, to his ministry, which I find kind of interesting. Now, what we do see is that Ezra and Nehemiah are, are placed in the Bible as sort of the immediate 
sequels, if you will, uh, of Chronicles. They really are, as written name, I really is a continuation of, the, of Chronicles. Um, and it does seem to go back all the way to the original collection of Nehemiah, who might have collected um, not only his memoirs, but maybe stories about this period of time, stories about uh, the, the priest uh, Ezra, too. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see these, uh, these themes and these differences in the personalities between the two of them, and their different focuses um, will all emerge in, in different and present in different ways. But now I want us to turn our focus to the book of Ezra and start taking a close look at his story. So Ezra opens up, like I mentioned, with that, those clear connections, drawing really close, clear connections between um, the end of the book of Chronicles and this new story that is starting here in Ezra. But he also alludes to the prophet Jeremiah, saying, you know, just as Jeremiah predicted, 70 years of exile, those 70 years passed, and the exile ended, you know. So this is all sort of set up as a framing device to understand how the narrative of Ezra is just starting out and getting started. In chapter 1, we have what seems like a verbatim copy of an actual decree that was issued by Cyrus with orders concerning the rebuilding of the temple and the resumption of the daily offices. Um, you might actually already be familiar with these daily offerings that I'm referring to, um, which become a, a big deal in Ezra um, and a concern, you know, of Cyrus and Cyrus's decree. Uh, but if you're not familiar, um, you can kind of think about it. There were two prayer services, one in the morning, one in the evening. If you've ever prayed holding evening prayer with us, you may remember singing that line, uh, the lifting up of our hands at the evening sacrifice. That's from a psalm, and that's the psalm is referring to the evening a sacrifice, the evening prayer service. So there was one in the morning, one in the evening, and these daily prayer services, they were really integral. And they were very important to the Jewish spiritual life. And so, if you're thinking about restoration, you're thinking about restoring, rebuilding the temple, resuming these daily prayer services, they really were paramount to Ezra's ministry and this whole story about rebuilding the temple. So, we're told the people, uh, they return to the land, they settle in it, um, they occupy it, they uh, come with two leaders, uh, Jeshua, the high priest who descended from Aaron, uh, and Zerubbabel, um, who is a descendant of the house of David. But he's not king, of course. There's only one king. There's only one Persian king. But this son of David, uh, Zerubbabel, becomes the governor. Um, and they are focused then in chapter 3 on the rebuilding of the temple. Now I want you to think about something interesting. Both Zerubbabel and Nehemiah are Jews, who also are Persian governors. Isn't that interesting? Because if you think about like Pilate and Jesus and Rome, right? The Roman governor in Jesus' day was a Roman. But the Persians had a different way of administering their empire. They used local governors um, with the, the, the same ethnicity of the people that they were governing as liaisons between Persia, the imperial um, bureaucracy, and the local governance. So um, that, that might explain why a, a, a descendant of David is um, not king, but governor of Judah during this time. It might also explain uh, why Nehemiah, as a Jew, uh, becomes governor eventually. So Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the people there in Jerusalem, they start working on restoring the temple. And in fact, they're able, they do a pretty good job initially. Um, they're able to restore the inner courtyard and the altar there at the, the center of the temple. Um, and this was just a this was just a really small area. The temple was a very large complex. It's only a small area, and it was the area that was primarily responsible for those daily prayer services. And because of that, even though the temple was not fully rebuilt yet, daily worship at the temple was able to be restored during this time. But the rebuilding of the rest of the temple would be delayed for a long time. 
I tried to think about an example that might help illustrate what went on here. And I struggled to find something that worked really, really well. But um, just imagine for a moment, um, heaven forbid this ever happened, but imagine for a moment that St. Mark's uh, burned down to the ground. The actual building itself um, experienced a ca ca catastrophe. Uh, a fire that uh, resulted in the whole building being ruined. Now, because the building is in ruins, you probably can still tell, like, oh, this was our worship space, you know, and this was the, you know, adult ed room, and this was the fellowship hall. So it would be like us, after the St. Mark's building being burnt down, that we swept off the chancel floor and restored that to its former glory uh, and rebuilt an altar there. And then we said, well, now that we have an altar, we can resume worship. And it would be like us gathering every week at St. Mark's in the actual ruins of the building with just the altar and the chancel sort of uh, restored. That's kind of like what's going on here uh, in Ezra 3. Um, it was a temporary fix for the solution. And this makes sense. You know, it makes sense, you know, if you are returning to a desolate, a, a desolate land, a land that has been destroyed, and you are working on rebuilding, you have to prioritize. Um, and, but there's a lot of tension here um, over why is this happening? Is this delay good or just? Um, and certainly, the frustration of many prophets, and explicitly the prophet Haggai, um, was really, really frustrated with the delays in the temple. We will look closer at Haggai a little bit later on uh, to get his perspective on uh, the, temp the delay in rebuilding the temple. Now, what caused the delay? Well, to be honest, we aren't 100% sure. When we read the narratives of Ezra and Nehemiah, um, we get sort of uh, an idea. When we read Haggai, we get another impression. Um, when we read Haggai in particular, um, kind of the, the impression I get is that God's people were like, well, we fixed the chancel, we fixed the inner courtyard, we got, you know, we made sure that sacrifices could resume, we're able to worship, that's good enough. Uh, and as can happen, human procrastination, um, just and, and maintaining the status quo. It might have been that part of what was going on here was that um, God's people were just focused on other other construction work. Um, and again, much to much of the uh, dissatisfaction of Haggai, um, and we'll, again, we'll look at uh, him and his perspective a little bit later on. Um, you know, another perspective that we get is that is from Ezra himself. Uh, Ezra has this all figured out. He knows why the delay happened. Uh, and in Ezra chapter 4, it all starts with conflict. Conflict between the Jews that had come back to the land and the Gentiles that were their neighbors who lived uh, around them. Um, and uh, the, the conflict between God's people and their adversaries are something that we see not just in Ezra, but also in Nehemiah. So both Ezra and Nehemiah have these conflicts. Ezra, again, frames it around rebuilding the temple. Nehemiah, similar conflicts, but framed around rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. So both in Ezra and Nehemiah, we get this impression um, that it was in part and partial because of conflict between other people who were their neighbors. This all kicks off in chapter 4 when, as they're working on rebuilding the temple, um, God's people get an offer from their Gentile neighbors and offer to help them rebuild the temple. Isn't that nice? But guess what God's people did? They rejected it. They turned it down. And I gotta be honest with you, I have always found that strange, odd. You know, if I was, you know, if my home, if my temple, if my church was devastated and my Jewish neighbor, or my Muslim neighbor wanted to help me out, I wouldn't have a problem with that. Um, so it, it is a little of a struggle for us to ask the question, why would the local adversaries of God's people offer to help God's people if they are already adversary? And why did God's people reject the offer? Well, so one way to interpret this 
is that, um, you know, maybe, maybe they were genuine. Maybe they really did want to help. Maybe they were, you know, just um, trying to help the neighbors. Uh, and I empathize with that because that's probably what I would do. I would want to help my neighbor in need. Um, but the impression we get from Ezra and Nehemiah was that this was not the case. That they really were not genuine uh, in their offer. God's people might have rejected this offer because they knew that they weren't serious. They knew that the offer wasn't genuine. Or it could be like, you know what? You are Gentiles and we are Jews. We are rebuilding our temple for our God. There's no point in you who do not worship our God to rebuild our temple. It doesn't make any sense. Um, and maybe that's why they rejected the offer of help from their neighbors. But the reason that I have often interpreted that the offer of help uh, has, is as being disingenuous is because when the Jews do reject the help, their adversaries don't just go, okay, whatever, you know, and just walk away. What they actually do is the exact opposite of what they offered to do. Uh, they actually immediately begin to work to frustrate uh, the reconstruction uh, efforts at the temple. And if that being the case, again, makes me really interpret that what's going on here isn't, a, um, uh, isn't an offer that's being made in good faith. Specifically in Ezra, what Ezra records is that um, they end up bribing officials in the court of the king. They are involved in um, just adversarial kind of work, sort of denouncing the Jews to the king, this construction project to the king. Um, and so ultimately what happens is there is a cessation in the work of the temple, comes to a complete halt. Uh, and that pause in construction lasted quite some time. Um, we aren't exactly sure how long, um, but it was years, uh, we know. Now, um, even though there was this long delay, God's people tried to get things started back up and going. And when they tried to restart simple construction, they were stopped. An appeal was made directly to the king. Now this is King Darius, still the ruler of Persia, but um, not Cyrus, not even Cyrus's son. This is a new dynasty. Um, so uh, Darius isn't familiar with, um, with the decrees of Cyrus. And when they come before the king, when they make the appeal to the king to allow them to continue rebuilding the temple, they point out, they say the reason they are doing this work is because they are under order from King Cyrus, King Darius's predecessor. So Darius is a shrewd ruler. He doesn't just take them at face value. Um, he orders for a search to be done of all the royal archives throughout all the kingdom of Persia. And they do. They find the edict from King Cyrus. They bring it before Darius. Darius reads it, and he discovers. Darius discovers he actually owes the Jews money because Cyrus committed to pay for the, um, the re restoration work. Um, and for uh, paying for the daily sacrifices and things like that to resume temple worship. So in the end, um, God's people are vindicated. Their adversaries are put to shame. Uh, construction on the temple uh, continues. And finally, finally, after a long period of work and delay, the temple is finally restored. Uh, the people gather, they celebrate Passover together at the temple, they rededicate the temple. Um, we'll look a little bit closer at Ezra's uh, prayer, either of dedication or uh, of repentance, a little bit later on. We do, however, get the impression that this temple was a lot less, shall we say, splendid than uh, Solomon's temple, the, the preceding temple. Um, and interestingly enough, this temple that we're talking about in Ezra's day still isn't even the temple of Jesus' day. Between the stories of Ezra and Jesus' own ministry, um, the, the temple was um, restored, renovated, uh, expanded, however you want to uh, term that, by Herod the Great. Um, he was involved with a big, uh, lots of building projects throughout the kingdom during the time, and one of them was he made a, a massive... Uh, addition to the temple. And that is the temple that Jesus would be familiar with. So this isn't the temple that Solomon built. This isn't the, the temple that Jesus was familiar with. This was 
um, sort of an intermediate step, if you will. But this temple, maybe not as splendid as the one in the past, maybe not as splendid as the one that would come, uh, but it did fulfill all the requirements under the law for worship to take place in Jerusalem. And that was the most uh, important part, of course. I do also want to mention that in Ezra 6, there's this beautiful passage about the dedication of the temple. Uh, it describes how the young people who were there gathered, they shouted for joy and celebration. They wept with joy at the splendor of the temple. But also at that gathering were elders, people who had witnessed the splendor of the temple before its destruction. And they wept too out of sadness and grief. Um, I find that incredibly compelling because we know that, it, it, that the dedication of the temple, it was a joyful period, but it was also something that was sad. And it reminded God's people of how much had also been lost during that period. We often experience that. You know, I know of um, widows and widowers who get remarried and their marriage celebrations are a time of great um, um, bittersweet time. It is a time of great joy, but it's also a time of grief at the loss of, you know, what is no longer there. So I find that interesting that we, we get a bit of that witness here uh, from Ezra. Now, the final little bit I want to look at today before we call it quits comes from chapter 7. This is where Ezra finally makes it into the story. Ezra isn't actually involved in even his own book until chapter 7. Um, so finally, the namesake appears. Uh, in, in chapter 7, we hear that King Artaxerxes, now even another uh, Persian king, uh, gives Ezra permission to return to the land. He comes with a group of people um, they, that consisted of priests, uh, musicians, artisans. These were the people who would have been engaged in temple worship if there had been a temple before this point. So Ezra returns with a, a group of, of, of temple leaders at a critical time um, when worship from in the temple was being restored. And what we get then is an impression from Ezra of what was necessary for right worship in Jerusalem. Interestingly enough, Ezra carries with him the command of the king, an actual edict with him to go to Jerusalem to resume service of God uh, and to enforce the law of Moses, something that's going to factor big into our conversation next week. This gives Ezra an immense amount of authority, much like how um, Nehemiah would have a lot of authority as the governor. We're not exactly sure what happened to Zerubbabel, but at some point in time, he fades into the background before uh, Nehemiah arrives. And there might have been a bit of a power vacuum during this time. Ezra, as, as, uh, as the high priest, um, or excuse me, I should just say priest, might have filled this role for a time because he did have this authority from the king uh, to oversee the work of restoration, both spiritual and practical. Ezra even details that the Persian king orders that the daily expenses of the service be provided by Persia. Uh, and so once again, we can see how very, very different uh, the Persians were from the Babylonians. Now, Ezra is going to be involved with a lot of different ministry areas, which we'll talk about next time. He has some, uh, shall we say, controversial opinions, and we'll take a, a little bit closer look at those, um, and uh, because they do deserve us taking a close look at what he believes and what he teaches. But for now, I just want to remind all of us that Ezra is just one voice, there are many different opinions out there about um, how restoration is to be enacted among God's people. Ezra is just one of those voices. Even though our main character is just now appearing, we've already seen some of these themes and these perspectives presented in the book that bears his name, mostly in the form of conflict between the Jews and their Gentile neighbors. And that is where we'll pick up next time. But for now, this is all. Thank you all for joining me. I hope to see you next time. And until then, peace be with you all.